interesting uh, slow <coughs> unconscious sort of process. And indeed, the odd thing is that the terms oligarch and oligarchy rather went out of common speech while it was going on. We reserved such terms for regimes of the past, like the English Whigs of the 18th century or, or the Doges of Venice. Oligarchs belonged in the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle and in the history of Herodotus and Thucydides, not in our own political debates. Then, surprisingly, only in the last few years, the word oligarch was revived, but not with reference to our own affairs, but to describe what was happening somewhere quite else in a totally different context. The breakup of the Soviet Union and the selling off by the state on extremely favorable terms of the country's huge reserves of oil and gas and minerals to a handful of nimble freebooters. These new oligarchs speedily amassed wealth on a scale not seen under the czars. They have panned out around the world, buying football clubs, palaces, works of art, with an abandon which has scarcely dented their colossal fortunes. They have prospered in a very modern type type of oligarchy in which free speech and the machinery of democracy are tolerated, but only in so far as they do not menace the power of the ruling group and the wealth of the oligarchs. Now this type of oligarchy was born out of the chaos that followed the breakdown of the regime, which had regarded itself and was regarded by the rest of us as, as all powerful. We had a special word for it, totalitarian, because its power seemed so pervasive. These totalitarian regimes were expected to last for anything up to a thousand years. So it came to a, as a shock to both their supporters and their opponents when they dissolved overnight and these agile new men left to the big, empty space left behind. Our own British type of oligarchy isn't like that at all. It's not an empty space. On the contrary, the new arrangements have arisen because our society seems to us so congested only by concentrating and streamlining power, whether from the left or the right, it seemed could we hope for the system to work as we would like it to. And if you'd like an example of that, uh, uh, related to where we are this evening, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the enlargement of the Department of Education from a tiny building near Waterloo Station to a monstrous monolith, and its intervention under first the Tories, then under Labour, and now under the Tories again, into every aspect of, of school life and school organization. Um, power has been gathered into the center in education, just as it has been in, in banking or business or almost any other organization you care to think of. Because what was needed was for a simplification, to clear lines of control, clear and unquestioned leadership. It's hard almost to remember now how widely dispersed power in Britain was um, before the Second World War and even for a few years of the post-war period. In most concerns, more people had a final say. Supervision or control from head office or from Whitehall was sketchy and intermittent and sometimes remarkable by its absence. In local government, for example, we can still remember the days when there was scarcely a head office at all. Local authorities had untrammeled power to set the level of their own taxes, business and domestic rates. Well, their powers were limited by acts of parliament. Within those limits, they could do pretty much with those powers what they felt about. Not anymore. That kind of day-to-day -day freedom has been whittled away under both governments, and those sorts of government, by an ever-intensified network of financial controls and regulations. This is equally true of public institutions, such as hospitals, schools, universities, and police forces, as it is of private commercial organizations, such as banks, bookshops, insurance companies, broadcasting, and building societies. For the managers, all these thickening networks of control appear increasingly normal, in fact, indispensable if they were to manage. The haphazard scatter of branches and members had to be transformed into a single body which could live and breathe only if it operated on consistent and thoroughly enforced guidelines. So this gigantism led to centralization, and centralization led to something else. 
and our own Niralika has come to think of themselves as a single organ, set apart from and responsible for the rest of the body. They become management. These corporates, as they also happy to call themselves, develop quite naturally their own shared interests and strategies. They become a self-conscious class, one which learns to look out for itself and whose members, while engaging in strenuous competition for the top slots, do also look out for each other. Long ago, sociologists like Pareto and Mosca realized that one distinguishing feature of such elites is that they circulate, they revolve. Years later, Anthony Sampson popularized the same insight in his Anatomy of Britain. Once admitted to membership of the elite, these characters crop up again and again at the head of every type of organization, public and private. In these circumstances, it is not surprising that the interlocking elites in the ballroom should contrive to fix each other's remuneration at magnificent levels, regardless of the performance of the firm in question. For as J.K. Galbraith puckishly pointed out, the salary of the chief executive of a large corporation, it is not a market reward for achievement. It is frequently in the nature of a warm personal gesture by the individual to himself. <laughs> we have seen in the past few years staggering payoffs in pension pots awarded to chief executive officers who between them have made some of the most catastrophic decisions in the history of capitalism. Not just in the legendary St. Fred Goodwin, but Eric Daniels who bought the perfectly solvent Lloyds Bank for his knees by buying HBOS at Gordon Brown's invitation, and to Sir John Bond, the much respected chief of HSBC, who paid nine billion pounds, nine billion pounds for the American subprime mortgage firm of households, which turned out not only to be a notorious predatory lender, but also worthless. And this judgment isn't given in hindsight over only the city editor, uh, I remember the city editor of the uh, Daily Telegraph, among others, the day after the uh, they bought this, um, uh, this trailer park mortgage firm, wrote at the time, household is the sort of acquisition that has danger written all over it. <laughs> and, and what we actually forget is that the collapse of household was the first brick in, in the wall to crumble as the sub subprime crisis unleashed its mayhem. And HSB is famous as being one of the best run banks in the world, which tells you what the others are. <laughs> <laughs>